Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker was released in April of 2010 for the PlayStation Portable, and again one year later as part of the Metal Gear Solid HD collection for PS3 and Xbox 360. Ever since its initial release, the game has garnered high praise from fans and critics alike. In this video, I will give an in-depth analysis of the game, addressing the story, gameplay and presentation of Peace Walker. First, let me tell you a bit about where I'm coming from. I only first played the Metal Gear Solid games about two years ago. That is, all except Peace Walker and Portable Ops, and to this day, I still haven't played the latter. Since then, I've been in love with the series. So much so, that if I had to pinpoint only one game as my absolute favorite, Metal Gear Solid 3 Snake Eater would probably take the cake. Anyway. One year after first being introduced to the series, I played all of them again, together with my cousin, who at that point hadn't played any of them. After completing the fourth one, we decided to give Peace Walker a shot, since it's the bridge between Snake Eater and the upcoming Phantom Pain. Just like me, he really liked 1 through 4, and just like me, he was kinda skeptical about Peace Walker. It not being a main title, in addition to originating from a handheld, kept our expectations pretty low but we were open for surprises. Neither of us knew anything about the game, nor did we read any reviews beforehand. We went in with nothing but our personal expectations. In addition to that, we had just played all of the previous games, so they were still fresh in our memories. In the end, both of us hated the game, and still do with a passion. I, in particular, was stunned to figure out that people really love this game, praising it as one of the series' best especially since so many were critical of MGS3's micromanagement or MGS2's use of Raiden as the main character, both of which I wasn't bothered by. But I'll stop rambling for now. First, let's take a look at the game's story and characters. There's one major element to the plot that I'll discuss in greater detail later, so I'll only summarize the basics now. Ten years after Operation Snake Eater, Big Boss has created his own private army, making him a sort of mercenary leader. He is hired by a professor, who turns out to be a KGB agent, to investigate a local Cuban conflict. In exchange for his efforts, he would be granted an offshore plant in the Caribbean Sea, to use as his base of operations. Well, what'll it be? Will you take the job? Soon after arriving in Cuba, Snake meets a young woman called Amanda and her brother Chico. The two of them are part of a resistance who fight the local military force. They take us captive, torture us for information about our compass, and then they kill us like pigs. Got it! All right! Snake offers them the opportunity to work for him as part of his private army which they gladly accept. Later on, he meets a scientist named Huey, who tells him of a secret military project called the Peace Walker Project, the aim of which is to create an AI-controlled robot, which acts as a nuclear deterrent, capable of launching nukes if it detects an incoming attack. The head of this project is Hot Coleman, who believes in the theory that humans wouldn't be able to retaliate, due to the moral dilemma created by using weapons of mass destruction. But the theory of nuclear deterrence exists only on paper. In reality, there's no guarantee that either side would follow through with retaliation. He believes that this moral weakness, as he calls it, could be exploited by other parties to attack without having to fear retaliation. For this reason, he states that a weapon like Peace Walker is necessary, for it wouldn't have second thoughts regarding nuclear retaliation. Which is why we designed the system to be unmanned. With Peace Walker, retaliation is certain. Huey tells Snake that the project is in its final testing phase, which means launching a missile in order to test its capabilities and prove that it is capable of doing so. 
the two of them make plans to infiltrate the laboratory where Peace Walker's AI is being built to stop Coldman from firing. On arrival, Snake meets Dr. Strangelove, oh, I get it. who is responsible for creating Peace Walker's AI core. He fails to destroy the core and now has to travel to Peace Walker's hangar and destroy the weapon before it's too late. After infiltrating the hangar, Coldman and Strangelove capture and torture Snake. <laughs> He quickly escapes from his prison though, but only to witness the weapon being activated. Snake attacks the robot head on, but before he is able to destroy it, Coldman and Strangelove make it retreat to a safer launch site. Snake follows them, but is unable to keep up. They arrive at a heavily guarded military base on the Cuban border, which Snake has to fight his way through in order to catch up to our villains. Snake confronts Coldman, who tells him that they chose Snake's mother base as Peace Walker's new target. Zadornov suddenly enters the scene, shoots Coldman and takes control of Peace Walker. He changes Peace Walker's launch target yet again, this time to be Cuba. His plans are to create a conflict between the US and Middle America, while simultaneously bringing Peace Walker back to Russia. Eagerly endorsed and supplied by a pro-American regime, what's the international community to think? The world will burn with anti-American sentiment. Communism will spread across Latin America unchecked. Ah! Let the age of deterrence be undone by the deterrent itself. Such is the Kremlin's plan. The situation seems hopeless. Snake is surrounded by military personnel and has no way of preventing Sedorna from initiating Peace Walker's launch. Snake's private army, led by Amanda and Chico, bust in to rescue Snake and capture Sedorna and the mortally wounded Coldman. The team celebrates their victory and get ready to leave. However, it turns out Coldman isn't finished yet. In his dying moments he says that he wants to prove his theory of deterrence by having Peace Walker prepare for launch, as well as send false nuclear missile data to the US Defense Force. He says that even if they think the missiles are real, they won't retaliate, for humans are incapable of bearing such responsibility. Everything will be fine. They'll never retaliate. They're only human. With that, Coldman dies, and it turns out the US is very well capable of retaliation, leaving Snake no other choice than to destroy Peace Walker before the US launches its missiles. After a long fight, Peace Walker goes down, but continues to send data to the US. Let's take a quick break here and discuss the game's characters for a second, for what happens next ties into what I've been neglecting to talk about up to now. There is a total of 9 characters in this story, excluding Big Boss, and I'll take time to look over each of them now. First is Kazuhira Miller, who acts as the counterpart to Colonel Campbell or Major Zero from previous titles. This time, however, instead of being Snake's superior, he's Snake's friend, and acts as a supporter as opposed to an employer. His personality is overall one of the cast's more fleshed out ones. There is one problem though. They never show him and Snake acting as friends would. In previous games, certain characters felt like they had a connection. A good example for this would be Snake and Otacon. They are deeply dedicated to their mission, but that doesn't keep them from making fun of one another or caring for each other if they go through rough times every once in a while. But I'll remember everything you were and stick with you to the end. Otacon. Besides, you wouldn't let me suffer Sonny's eggs alone, would you? Peace Walker makes no effort of making me believe these two are friends, other than just telling me. 
the way it is, Kaas feels more like Big Boss's secretary rather than his buddy. Next is Huey, who is Snake's second major supporter. His character is the easiest to describe. He is Otacon. No, I'm not joking, he's pretty much a carbon copy of Otacon from previous installments, right down to his voice actor and looks. Call me Snake. Snake. That name seems familiar somehow. Yeah, it's probably just Asia. That doesn't even make sense. Now, you may say Huey is Otacon's father. Of course they'll be alike. But to that I answer, compare yourself to one of your parents. Do you look the same, have the same voice, and share the same personality traits? I didn't think so. Next are Amanda and Chico. I decided to throw them together as they are about equally important. Both of them are met twice during the early game and once at the end, which makes them pretty unnecessary. They don't really contribute anything to the main plot, rather they have their own little subplot. Even though they lead Snake's rescue at the end, this could have been done by anyone. Heck, it could have just been any random soldier who said something like, we can't leave our boss alone in the face of danger. It's not like I don't understand why they're included though. The whole message of the game is peace. Overthrowing their suppressors and bringing peace back to Cuba is reinforcing that message. Though, I think it would have been better if they cut this whole side plot and focused more on the main story, since none of the other games had any weird side stories like this. Our last supporter is Cecile, who is even easier to summarize than Huey for we know next to nothing about her. She is met once and never plays into the plot again. What I can say about her is that she likes birds and has a thick French accent. I am without even the means to prove who I am. I will not make it home to Paris like this. Now we get to our villains. First, Zadornov. He has a really cool voice. Central America is the navel of the American continents bridging north and south. We want this land. We'll build a socialist stronghold, then use it to split the Americas in two. And a robot hand. Hmm? He is basically the game's personification of war, as he strives to gain control of Peace Walker and use it to support Russia in its war against America. In the beginning he also claims to be a professor of peace, which I find to be utterly hilarious, even though the study of peace is actually a thing called ironology. Our second major antagonist is Hot Coldman, who aside from having a silly name is actually not a bad villain. His whole philosophy of deterrence is actually a quite interesting and unique motivation. There is one line in the game though meant to make him look cool, I guess, but hearing it just makes me cringe. I know all about you. Tulino Yarsk, ten years ago, you were involved. The operation to eliminate the traitor. I planned the whole thing. If you've played Snake either, then you know that that is one of the stupidest retcons to any story ever. Operation Snake Eater had no mastermind behind it. It was a means to cover up the US's mistakes, claiming it to be anything other than that, or even suggesting that it was planned from the beginning is ridiculous. The foibles of politics and the march of time can turn friends into enemies just as easily as the wind changes. Ridiculous, isn't it? Yesterday's ally becomes today's opposition, and this Cold War Think back. When I was leading the Cobras, America and Russia were fighting together. Now, consider whether America and Russia will still be enemies in the 21st century. Somehow I doubt it. Enemies change along with the times, the flow of the ages, and we soldiers are forced to play along. I don't even know why they didn't just leave this line out. It doesn't even play into Peace Walker's story in any way. Regardless, the real problem with this character is, other than his motivation, there isn't really anything to his personality, meaning most of the time he just comes across as cheesy. 
that on its own isn't a problem. Snake Eater had Colonel Volgan, who was an incredibly cheesy villain, right down to even having a maniacal laugh. <laughs> Snake Eater takes itself way less serious though, which goes back to what the Metal Gear Solid franchise is so good at, mixing serious and heartfelt scenes with funny and ridiculous ones in an almost seamless fashion. Even Volgan had more character traits than Coldman though. He's sadistic, an incredible narcissist, and also bisexual. This is a problem Peace Walker has as a whole. It lacks personality. There is no charisma to any of these characters. Even Big Boss, who was so playful and full of unique character traits in Snake Eater, is reduced to your average gruff McMilitary guy. Our last obvious villain is Doctor Strangelove, who is the most developed of Peace Walker's characters. That is, if you took the time to find and listen to her secret tapes. Without those, she greatly lacks in motive and depth, making her a very boring and underdeveloped villain. She has an unusual obsession with the boss. In some of the tapes, it is even suggested that she may have been sexually attracted to her. As I listened to her voice, I was wrapped in her soothing scent. I felt as if I were dreaming. Even in failure, she seemed perfect. I will talk about those tapes in greater detail later. For now, let's just leave it at her being a very interesting and relatable character, but only with the tapes in consideration. I'm a scientist, an AI developer, but not an AI myself. I'm a scientist, and as a scientist, I find this distasteful. You understand? I am a scientist, and I expect answers that make sense. Now let's get to the one that I've been neglecting to talk about so far. Paz. She's an about 16-year-old girl who turns out to be a villain at the end. She's introduced at the very beginning of the game and claims to have studied peace as the Dornoff student. She is pretty much ignored throughout most of the story. It's only near the end that she is kidnapped by Coldman to give Snake another reason to hate him. After the main story is completed, you can do all sorts of optional side missions, and if you meet certain requirements, she can take control of Metal Gear Seek, which is a Metal Gear that Big Boss had built on Mother Base. What she says during this scene is actually quite interesting. Until the new order is in place, you and your army will be the force that protects it. You will be Cypher's deterrent, pulling the wool over the ice of the old order with your charisma and military prowess. Accept our offer, and we will allow you to retain control of MSF and Zeke. That's an offer. The boss threw down her gun, and with it, her life's call. You, her disciple, have never been able to do that. You are too afraid to let go. I can't really take her serious in that getup though. After Snake defeats her, she disappears and isn't seen again until Ground Zeroes. Paz also gets further character development in her own collection of secret tapes, and it's a shame they didn't find a way to have it be part of the story. Just like Strangelove's tapes, they are written really well, and Snake and Kaz even get some funny interactions. At last the two men tired themselves out, and the bizarre scene came to an end. They looked at each other's battered bodies, and then burst out laughing, embracing and congratulating each other on a good fight. Generally speaking, one of Peace Walker's biggest problems is the lack of interesting and unique characters. Apart from the fourth, all installments introduced an array of new characters, both serious and funny. The best example for this is Snake Eater's cast. Every character is just bursting with energy and personality. Even the relatively underdeveloped Cobra unit are incredibly memorable due to their individual personalities and the way they present themselves. The funniest character moment in Peace Walker's story is this. You got it, boss. Uh, Snake is fine. What's that? Ah!
And there are only a handful of moments like this one, because Peace Walker takes itself incredibly serious, one might argue even more so than MGS4. Neither the story nor the characters are strong enough to keep it from getting boring though. There is a second part to Peace Walker's story, which discusses the boss. The ultimate reason why Big Boss accepts Sodornov's offer is because he plays him a recording that includes a quote from his old mentor. Go home. Boss, voice print analysis confirms that this voice is indeed that of the legendary hero and criminal, the boss. As I mentioned before, Strangelove has an obsession with the boss. This is driven so far that she creates Peace Walker's AI, the Mammal Pod, to have her personality. She goes about this by gathering all data she could find on her and programming it into the AI. Even though personality isn't deductible by facts and documentation, I'm able to suspend my disbelief for this one. What I cannot accept is essentially turning the boss from one of the best female characters in gaming into a simple plot device. The AI is not shown as a recreation of the boss's personality. All it does is quote her, to the point where it gets annoying. And go home. I'm not your boss anymore. Go home. Why did you come back? Go home. I'm not your boss anymore. Go home. Throughout the story, the central conflict of Snake Eater is redone from beginning to end, in the form of flashbacks to Snake's fight with the boss. The conversation the two of them have during these scenes is changed from Snake Eater, turning the tone from somberly regret-filled to harsh and confrontational. I've never talked this much about myself before. Thanks. Thanks for listening to me. I feel content. There's a saying in the Orient, loyalty to the end. Do you know what it means? Being patriotic. It means devoting yourself to your country. <laughs> we have loyalty to the end, there's no point in believing in anything, even in those we love. Furthermore, they use lines which were originally spoken way earlier in the story, and used to set up events that were yet to unfold. There's a saying in the Orient, loyalty to the end. Do you know what it means? Being patriotic. It means devoting yourself to your country. I follow the president and the top brass. I'm ready to die for them if necessary. This line, for example, is used in a context which makes no sense whatsoever. I'm defecting to the Soviet Union. Jack, you can't come with us. I'm defecting to the Soviet Union. Jack, you can't come with us. All of this is a major problem. It is highly disrespectful towards Snake Eater's well-written story, but it also makes Peace Walker flat out copy Snake Eater's driving question, why did the boss defect, in order to drive its own plot along, which is incredibly lazy. It's like if throughout Return of the Jedi, Luke had flashbacks to his fight with Vader at the end of Empire Strikes Back, leading up to Vader yet again revealing himself as Luke's father. That's not all though, they go so far as to even bring back the boss's horse. Later in the game, the horse is mortally wounded and Snake has to finish it off in the same fashion as he did for the boss. This time, I am in no way hesitant to pull the trigger though. 
This whole scene can almost be called the deliberate mockery of a legitimately sad moment, especially with the big red bang popping up. What makes the whole thing even stranger is that Snake knows what happened to the boss. When I first played the game, I thought he was in denial about what Eva told him at the end of Snake Eater. However, after replaying it, I understood that he deliberately denies her being anything other than a traitor for the sake of keeping it secret, especially from Strangelove, who could complete her AI with this information. Then again, the game doesn't really make it clear, only that Snake definitely knows about it at the end, when he is being tortured. I'm not helping you finish that thing. Face it, the boss is dead. Whatever's inside that machine, it is her. Either way, we come across a problem. If Snake doesn't remember Eva's recording, the whole thing makes Snake look like an idiot, for he was devastated at the end of Snake Eater. And for him to simply forget the whole thing, especially since he had such high respect for the boss and her loyalty, seems very unlikely. She was like a mother, and my master. And your lover? It went deeper than that. Deeper? Half of me belongs to the boss. But if Snake does remember the recording, both Snake and the player, who presumably played the previous installments, know what happened. If this is true, then there is literally no reason to tell this story again, no matter if it's done well or not. At the end of MGS2, it is revealed that the whole game was all staged to be a recreation of the Shadow Moses incident. Which is a great twist, especially since it's pretty subtle. But MGS2 assumes the player knows what the Shadow Moses incident is and what happened there, for it doesn't retread common ground and goes out of its way to explain it. Peace Walker, on the other hand, assumes either Snake or the player is a dumbass who forgot what happened. Now, you could say, what if Peace Walker is the first MGS1 place? Well, the game itself is so reliant on Snake Eater, even it assumes you've played it. Otherwise, none of the throwbacks like shooting the horse would matter to the player. Plus, it would spoil the big twist at the end of Snake Eater, which is a real shame. Anyway, at the end of the game, after defeating the Peace Walker, Snake has to rip out pieces of memory from the AI and fill the supposedly broken Peace Walker with bullets and rockets in an effort to stop it from sending its signal. This scene is meant to be very heartbreaking, as it is symbolic for beating on the boss's dead body. I didn't feel any remorse for the AI though. This whole scene is so ridiculous, even if I had no problem with the plot or characters up to this point, I'd still raise an eyebrow in disbelief. After that, the boss's soul, who apparently lives within the AI, makes the Peace Walker drown itself in the nearby water, which causes the signal to stop and everything to turn out fine. I won't dwell on the fact that I hate the idea of a soul possessing an AI, however, this whole concept comes out of nowhere, making it more of a deus ex machina than anything else. Now as I mentioned before, there are secret hidden tapes which can be listened to in the briefing menu. Strangelove's tapes in particular stand out though, as they are the only moment where Peace Walker can be considered a legitimately good addition to the series. In the first few tapes, Strangelove describes how she first met the boss and what an impact she had on her life through her inspiring words and comforting gestures. The boss in these tapes is portrayed pretty much the same way as she is in Snake Eater, as a very intelligent, self-confident and kind woman who has been shaped by her environment and her experiences as a soldier. But I was smitten. She was beautiful, yes, but more than that, she was wise. Her mind was thoroughly rational, and yet no matter how I tried, I could never predict her actions. It was easy for me to assume that her judgments were drawn from an enormous base of knowledge. Quite simply, her life experiences were more diverse, more intense than anyone else's. This great respect for her character stands in contrast to the main story, as I've explained before. Strangelove also gets major character development here. She tells us about her reasons for becoming an AI developer and shows a wide array of emotions while recalling her memories of the boss. She was loyal to the end, to our world. And I lost the light of my life. 
I now find myself victim to an incredibly <laughs> irrational emotion of my own. That someone, the one she wanted to confess her sin to, <sighs> could it be the one who took her life? The very thought drives me utterly mad with jealousy. <sighs> one day, I will discover the truth. Honestly, it baffles me. These tapes are so well written, it's almost insulting to have them only be a secret collectible no one really cares about. They are easily the best part of Peace Walker and yet are shoved to the side in favor of the inferior writing and character development presented throughout the main story. Now let's move on to gameplay. First I'll talk about general mechanics and changes from previous installments, and then about the stealth aspect. The most obvious change is that it's no longer tactical espionage action, but instead tactical espionage operations. All that really means though is that the game is now based around missions, similar to MGS4, only with multiple missions in the same setting. The reason for this change is it originating on a handheld, where many short missions are more manageable than fewer long ones. The problem here is that the length is not consistent. Some missions last as long as 20 minutes, while others can be completed in 3. I'm playing this on the PS3, but I can only imagine how infuriating it must be to be on the bus, for example, and having to stop a mission mid-game just because you thought you'd get another short one, only to have it be one of the longer ones. The thing is, this problem could have been easily prevented by putting an approximation of the mission's length on the selection screen. There is also one mission transition which is handled very poorly. After Snake escapes from his prison, he has to sneak around a few guards without his equipment. The mission ends with him going up a set of stairs. When the next mission starts, Snake is at the top of the stairs with all of his equipment back where it belongs. One new addition I really like is being able to recruit enemy soldiers into your private army via the Fulton recovery system. Okay, time to kidnap a dude. What? Hey, do you want to join our club? Oh, do you what? want to join our club? The recruited soldiers can be assigned to different teams back at Mother Base, which is the second big thing Peace Walker added. Mother Base acts as a sort of hub between missions. As mentioned, here you're able to assign members to work in specific subdivisions, like research and development or a combat unit. While it is fun to see your army grow over the course of the game, it is much more superficial than it seems at first. Every crew member has one subject in which their skills surpass the others, making the choice of where to put them a very meaningless one. If you want, you can even auto-assign them, relieving you from what is essentially busy work. There is also an option to send your combat team on missions, but there is really nothing to gain from doing so, and the little battle replay is not really worth the trouble. Next we have the aforementioned R&D team, who create weapons and equipment for you to use during missions. It's probably the most useful of Mother Base's functions, but usually you'll stick to two or three weapons you like, and ignore the rest, leaving you saying, Wow, I don't need any of those. And the same goes for the items. There are some I completely forgot existed, like potato chips or two different kinds of soda. I won't touch upon the game's multiplayer aspects in this video, as I have no personal experience with them. Which leaves us with Zeke's hangar. But before explaining how that works, I have to talk about the boss battles. The bosses in this game are the blandest the series has had so far. Even blander than the B&B &B core from MGS4. There is Armored Vehicle, Tank, Chopper, Shagomok, Bird Robot, Tank Robot, Peace Walker, and Zeke. Most of the previous bosses were duels against other people, with a vehicle or chopper thrown in there to mix things up a bit. None of these bosses had any personality, with maybe Zeke being the only exception, but only because Pass is controlling it, accompanied by a J pop song. <laughs>
not only are these bosses completely bland on a conceptual level, gameplay wise all of them can be reduced to shoot the big red obvious weak spot. Attack its weak point for massive damage. Again, with Zeke being the only exception, but even he is a bullet sponge. All of these bosses take zero strategy to defeat, but all of them take forever, even with the strongest damage dealing weapons in the game. Peace Walker and Zeke both took me 20 minutes. 20 minutes of this! And all the bosses are like this. Previous games had bosses that tested your skill in different ways, be it Fat Man testing your ability to think and act fast, The End making you resort to all your basic stealth tactics while giving you a patience test, or The Fury making you deal with extreme enemy pressure. That isn't to say all bosses were perfect. If you get past the gimmick, Psycho Mantis falls into a simple dodge the attack, shoot the dude pattern, and if you're using the thermal goggles, the fear becomes nothing more than a boring shooting gallery. Still, Peace Walker's bosses are so unimaginative, it's almost sad. All of the AI bosses sing this weird song, which gets annoying really fast, especially once you realize it's their attempt at making these war machines seem playful and innocent. <laughs> Every time you defeat one of the AI bosses, you may get some of their parts, depending on where you attack them. Boy, I wonder where they got that idea from. Once you have collected enough parts, you can build your own Metal Gear, which sounds way cooler than it actually is. Really, all you can do with it is change its color. Let's get to the core gameplay, the reason why people love Metal Gear Solid so much. The tactical enemy avoidance. Peace Walker's control scheme is very reminiscent of MGS4. However, it can be changed to one that resembles Snake Eater or one that resembles Monster Hunter. Oh. I think the MGS4 one works best though. You now have multiple equipment styles. Survival. Survival. Combat. Combat. And stuff. Stuff. I think it's meant to be stealth. Stealth. No matter. You can pretty much ignore stealth, as it has a lower ammo count than the others, and that's basically your only priority. Combat has the highest ammo count, but you only unlock it pretty late, meaning I ended up using survival throughout most missions. The camouflage from MGS3 makes a return, but it can be wholeheartedly ignored. You cannot change camouflage mid-mission, and even at minus 40 camo index, the enemies will hardly ever spot you, even if you're right in front of them. Looks like we're just in time. Neutralize all enemies and secure the train. This is another big problem Peace Walker has. The AI is, quite frankly, retarded. Board helicopter. Someone's firing at us. Going to alert status. Understood. Dispatching reinforcements. Proceed with extra caution. Excluding what I used to pump bullets into bosses, I used a total of two weapons and three items during my adventure. And yet the game gives you so many options that are less efficient than simply giving them a headshot with the MK22. At some points, you can really see that they wanted the players to mix up their playstyle, but all attempts just fall flat. Here are some examples.
Watch out. Enemy search may not spot enemies that are actively hidden. Bolton recovery helicopter is complete. Bolton recovery subject confirmed onboard helicopter. Careful if you don't want your head blown off. Wait. Huh. Somebody there? Even if you are spotted, the enemies are way too stupid to kill you. And especially with the addition of chaining CQC throws, you can take out a group of enemies in a whim. Another useless mechanic is a psych bar, which returns from MGS4. In this game, I don't even know what it does. I went through the whole game ignoring it. Overall, Peace Walker's gameplay is a very dumbed down version of a blend between MGS3 and 4. Last, let's take a look at Peace Walker's overall presentation, as well as other minor elements. First things first, the introduction. As with any Metal Gear Solid game, you have a tutorial explaining your basic actions. Peace Walker raises the bar though, teaching you literally how to look up and down. Look up! Good! Look down! Good! You should be familiar with the up and down controls now! This whole tutorial feels unbelievably redundant. All other MGS titles try to ease you into the game's mechanic before letting you loose on some first easy challenges. This, however, feels like pandering towards the lowest common denominator. However, you cannot move while you are lying down! What? You cannot move while lying down! Is that clear? Yes, you heard that correctly. In this game, you cannot move while lying down, nor can you move with your back against a wall. Why? <laughs> I really don't know. There are many such stripped elements in this game, and all of them combined together with the inept AI make the game feel much more casual than may have been intended. The codec is another thing that has been completely removed. This is something that started with MGS4 though. While MGS1 through 3 had some of their funniest moments within optional codec conversations, this game reduces it to this. This is Miller. Hearing you loud and clear. You know you can assign the radio to the select button by choosing options from the menu window. Riveting. One thing I can say in favor of Peace Walker is that it takes a different direction in regards to music. When heavens divide, I will see the choices within my head. While I really like the slick style of the old tunes, I can applaud it for at least trying something different, even if I may not be the biggest fan. There is one feature that I absolutely despise though. Yes sir, we broke them. We acquired the whereabouts of target 500. Acknowledged. Acknowledged. <laughs> 
Mid cutscene QTEs. When I'm watching a cutscene, I want to lay back, have a break, and enjoy what's unfolding on screen. I actually enjoy cutscenes, even though I'm a huge supporter of the Souls series progressive way of telling a story through gameplay, I don't need to have every game do that. It's fun to watch cutscenes if they're done well, like they mostly are throughout the Metal Gear Solid series. Here they are not though. The other thing I don't like about them is their art direction. They chose this crude comic style which looks pretty good at some points, but most of the time it just looks like garbage. You may disagree, but I think the in-engine cutscenes look way better than any of the comic ones. In conclusion, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker is the franchise's weakest entry. It may be serviceable as a PSP game, but it is nowhere near as good as any of the original games in regards to neither story nor gameplay. It shows great disrespect for Metal Gear Solid 3 and fails to create an intriguing plot or interesting characters. Gameplay wise, it feels more like an imitation of a stealth game than an actual one. For all the harshness I've given Peace Walker throughout this review, I won't deny that it features one of my favorite scenes from the entire series. Don't get me wrong, I still despise this game, and I will never play it again after this. But I have to give credit where credit is due. Plus, I don't like ending the video on such a sour note. Thank you very much for watching, and here is said scene. We will forsake our countries. We will leave our motherlands behind us and become one with this earth. We have no nation, no philosophy, no ideology. We go where we're needed, fighting not for country, not for government, but for ourselves. We need no reason to fight. We fight because we are needed. We will be the deterrent for those with no other recourse. We are soldiers without borders, our purpose defined by the era we live in. We will sometimes have to sell ourselves and services. If the times demand it, we'll be revolutionaries, criminals, terrorists. And yes, we may all be headed straight to hell. But what better place for us than this? It is our only home.